Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Morning Show Live here on ValleyTelevision.com. We are going to be uh, talking to Carla Meyer very shortly. But before we do that, I just wanted to kind of, for people that don't know what crystal meth is, I've pulled up some uh, statistics and some information. We talked about uh, we talked about it on Monday. So if you're watching on uh, Mo- Monday's show, we had uh, Rhonda Lee Ross in, and uh, she's a she worked with Youth in Crisis, so she had a bit of uh, insight about crystal meth, and uh, she, we talked quite a bit about it. But I, I like to, uh, if you're watching this again, uh, I for the for the viewers that weren't there on Monday, I would like to talk about uh, crystal meth and some of the uh, facts on crystal meth. Uh, crystal meth, uh, common street names are ice, crystal, glass, jib, uh, and, and Tina. <coughs> I don't know where they got Tina from, but they say that, um, the police say that an investment of about $150 can yield up about $10,000 worth of the drugs. It's cooked with chemicals commonly found at hardware stores such as red phosphorus, iodine, ammonia, paint thinner, ether, draino, and lithium from batteries. Uh, the drug can be either snorted or injected or in its crystal form, ice smoked in a pipe and brings on a feeling of exhilaration and sharpening of focus. Smoking ice results in an instantaneous dose of almost pure drug to the brain, giving a huge rush followed by a feeling of euphoria for anywhere from two to 16 hours. For some of this could result in obsessive cleaning or tidying, but many of the biggest bonuses is a sense of sexual liberation which can result in mad abandoned sex for hours, sometime days on end. And uh, according to a recent statistic study uh, among teens who, were an- who answered questions about drug use, 34% had tried marijuana, 4% had used ecstasy, 3% have used crack cocaine, 2% had used crystal meth, and 1% had used heroin. And a lot of this crystal meth is made in meth labs, and uh, clastine labs are all over the place. You see in the, the news all the time. They're found in apartments, houses, warehouses, vehicles, wooden areas, hotels, storage lockers, and other secluded places. And, uh, you know, that's what we have to stop is the manufacturing of this because it's, it's rampant as, as well as the people that use it. And uh, signs of potential meth labs include large quantity of disregarded packaging from precursors such as lantern fuel cans, red chemically stained coffee filters, blister packs uh, from cold remedy packages, uh, unusual amounts of clear glass containers being brought into the area of the lab, watching people outside all the time, eating dinner and stuff like that because it really puts up a a toxic uh, um, order and it creates eye irritation and stuff like that. That's why we see on the news when police are going in there, they go in blue suits with uh, oxygen tanks on them because it's, it's really potent. And it's really amazing that people can ingest stuff like this that's been made like that. And, uh, but that's, you know, that's what crystal meth is about. It's a real, uh, it's a real uh, problem that we have. And uh, that's, you know, a little bit about the, uh, about what crystal meth is, some of the facts. But let's uh, get right to our, our guest, Carla Meyer. Hi, Carla, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for coming on the show, and uh, you're looking good. Thank you. Yeah, you're feeling good? I feel great. Yeah, I feel great. Well, let's talk about you. Let's talk about uh, experiences. Now we know what, what crystal meth is and what it does. How did, let's start from the beginning. How did you uh, encounter crystal meth, and how did you get turned on to it? Um, I think my first encounter with it was I was with um, my ex-boyfriend now, and he <coughs> got caught up with it and I just wanted to fit in and be a part of and um, it was a huge thing to lose weight when I started doing it and um, it made you stay awake and the the sex drive and everything you know so um, I remember the first time I did it I I ended up going on a six seven day bender so it was quite a long stent for my for my first time Okay, it. and did you do it at your house, or were you, did you, how did you how did you find it? Your boyfriend turned you on to it. Yeah, I was living in Hope at the time. You're living in okay. I was living in Hope, and we had an apartment of our own, and he, we were into smoking pot and drinking, and he was a little bit older, and it just kind of, I I didn't know any education on it. I didn't know what it was, and that was my first introduction to it, and um, the. The usage of it didn't necess- It continued for a couple months, but when I moved back to Chilliwack, yep. 
um, I had gotten involved with crack pretty bad. And then I, after a couple months of that, with the expense and everything, I just m converted back over to the meth as almost a harm reduction because it was cheaper and the high lasted longer. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, as, as justifying as I wanted to put it, right? Yeah, you, qual you, you quantified it. And yeah. Okay. Expense <laughs> and and the high. That's and, the logical. And, and, and let's the, the high. How long did it last for you? Like you, if you, oh, you could smoke a bowl and it could last anywhere between two to two to eight hours, if not longer, because mm -hmm. you just continue you just continue doing it. You you maintain that because coming down, you who want you don't want to do that. It it hurts. It hurts your body to come down almost straight and mm. and um, the more you get into it and when you're high, you just kind of zip around and do your thing and and you don't even really r realize the effects of it you know yeah. you don't eat you don't sleep you just flail mm -hmm. out on whatever you're doing whether you're taking apart a bike or drawing or madly cleaning the house and that's all you did you, just, you had to do something you, you just, just had to you, do you couldn't something. sit and watch tv no no it'd be the last there thing there was you, you no contentment to. there oh and it says here uh, you're um, you're a crystal meth addict since the fall of 2005 but you said my that was that was my recovering date oh okay yeah. so and when did you start um i started How old were you? the the late years of 15 so 15 years old 15 yeah did you get a chance were you doing this in school then um i wasn't in school actually okay. yeah so i i wasn't introduced to it in school but i know that a lot of my friends who were around in hope and stuff they were they were doing it and they were in school and stuff and even now now when i look around it's so cheap and it's so accessible and it it is in the school systems and it's something mm -hmm. to be aware of mm -hmm. you know in the education there needs to be more of that well what do you think can be done then as uh, to say like in chilliwack society, here if it's in the school system how do we get it out of it society as a whole you need to have more prevention and education on it than anything like you just you got to pray that the that the students are smart enough right and that the parents you know, one thing parents need to do is not be afraid to talk to their children about mm -hmm. about drug use, about sexual activities, you know, because yep. they're going to find out about it sooner or later anyways. Yeah. Well, what what would stop you from not doing it? What would what, it? Was there something out there that would have stopped you? I don't know if I would if something would have necessarily stopped me. Um, I was on a destructive path, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it just kind of, ever since I was 12, it just this destruction after yeah. destruction yeah, for whatever reason right yeah and um i think now I'm, I'm using my past to better my future definitely right but mm -hmm. um i didn't know anything about it and maybe if i would have known stuff about it like yeah. they he presented it to me as speed like i didn't know what speed was mm -hmm. right and then now that i've been through it and i've i've personally experienced the effects the picking the late nights you know, mm -hmm. like not going to sleep for days, days on end, you know, mm -hmm. and things that like thinking that you're superhuman when you're on it and you're not like I see my friends now or people I used to use with and their face is so sunken in and they're just they look like death. Mm. What, what was your low of lows? My low of lowest? Um, the last six months were pretty low. I was living in what they call the ghetto, which is now bulldozed. Is yeah, but for for our information, actually, uh, we we were there. Valley Television, we filmed it uh, th when they busted the place. It, it was right across from Tim Hortons there at the Seven Eleven on uh, Williams and Yale, and uh, they brought out about twenty twenty something kids. Were you one of them? No, I wasn't. I wasn't there. I was clean at that time. I'm. Oh, talking, you were clean at that yeah, time. Was, okay. Yeah, I was talking. This happened about a year and a half ago down on Vetter and Knight Road. Um, the city came in and bulldozed that place, but the lows of lows oh, was, okay. I was living there for the last couple months of my, my using, and you know, we're in a little two bedroom suite, and there's 13 of us living living there, and you can't fall asleep, because if you did, you know, somebody would take your stuff, and mm. constant, just flail action all around you, and, and people sleeping with knives, and mm. you know, just a, a constant paranoia from it. Well, out of all that, uh, we don't have to get too f further in. We probably got a good idea where you got with that. But out of, you're in the midst of that. What can, what said, hey, you know, I've had enough. Everybody hits the bottom. Did you have a bottom? I, I had a bottom. I, it was that the, the place got bulldozed and I'm 18 years old 
and you know my my parents are like shaking their head at me and I'm I was trying to figure it out on my own and I ended up moving in with this man who was quite substantially older than I was and and he was a crack user and and I was just using him for the the drugs and money and I basically looked around after a couple weeks of staying there and, and I shook my head and the day before Thanksgiving is when I went home and said I need to go to detox. You went to your mom and dad? I went to mom and dad's and had Thanksgiving dinner and then the next day I oh, went wow. off to detox. They supported you? I went off to detox. Yeah, That was the only way I'd be able to come back home is okay. if I got clean. And I mean it was a constant thing from them. They tried to get me on the, the wait list you know, for Teen Challenge for different recovery homes and stuff and I wouldn't budge, I wouldn't go because it got to the point where you know I abs like I needed to confess to myself and I needed to confess to them that I could not get through the day without using. I I was mm -hmm. in physical pain and I I couldn't do it. Like I was getting in physical fights with my parents and like just ir irate behavior, something who I'm not and mm -hmm. and it's like the devil took over. Yeah. Do you ever watch Intervention? All the time. Uh, on A&E. That, nice that is a great show. Yeah. That's a great show. And you probably saw yourself in a lot of those episodes, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you you fought through that. You went to a, you went to a rehab? or I went to um, a 90-day treatment center. The first treatment center I went to, I got kicked out of because I used the phone before my probation. Oh, you did a Britney Spears, did you? <laughs> 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 um, so I used the phone before my probation period was up, and... and the administrator had no qualms of saying, pack your stuff and leave in the middle of Maple Ridge at 9 o'clock at night, recovering meth addict. I was like three weeks clean at the time. And so I did. I packed my stuff and I left. And I thought that was the end, you know. And, and the next day, I saw a beautiful sunrise and got on the phone and I got accepted into Trawford House the next day, which was an absolute blessing because I was on the wait list to get into the first recovery house for over a month and a half, uh -huh. right? So I went to treatment for 90, for four and a half months, I was there, and um, that was really hard. I was in there with 15 other women, half of them from the downtown east side, you know, and all of them, anywhere between crack addicts, heroin addicts, you know, most of them, a couple of them prostitutes and stuff, mm -hmm. right? So you have a lot of clashing attitudes mm -hmm. in there, and um, I was the youngest one in the treatment center, and um, it was really hard getting funding to get in there because I was so young. And I w like because I was only eighteen, right? And um, you need funding to go into these. Uh, yeah, it's it well, it's like forty dollars a day to go to a treatment center. So I mean, it it adds up. Um, income assistance pays for it, or if you're court ordered. Oh, okay. Um, th so there is some uh, funding. Uh, there is funding. Assistant. Okay. Yeah. Good, if good. if you want help, the help is there. Yeah. You just need to be patient and, oh. and jump through the. Or have your parents come in and get it, get you going. Or or pay for it, right? Even then, that's. It's, it's expensive to go to treatment if you're funding it on your own. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I was there and um, it was great. I went to Burnaby for treatment and you know the hardest part I think was coming back to Chilliwack when I was done and learning to live with that, um, to be content and to, to figure out where I need to be when the last you know four and a half years of my life has been destruction. Okay, so where does this contentment come from mm -hmm. now that I'm back at home? And it's been a struggle. It's been a huge struggle. Yeah, how long have you been uh, straight now? I'm um, going on 17 months. 17 months. Congratulations. You know what? we got to go to commercial break, Carla. And uh, we'll be right back. And we're going to talk a little bit about what you're doing now in okay. the community. And that. I know you're doing a lot of good things. Got, I read a lot of good things about you. And we're going to talk to Carla Meyer about that right after these commercial breaks. Hello everyone, welcome back to Morning Show Live here on ValleyTelevision.com. We're just in the middle of a conversation with uh, Carla Meyer, a recovery meth addict, who has uh, done well in our first part there. We, we talked about some of the effects and how she got there and uh, that she got into rehab. But you're out of rehab now, you've been clean for 17 months, you say? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're back in school now? I just got my diploma you in, got, wow, in congratulations. addictions counseling, yeah, I wrote my Last exam on Thursday, actually, so I was, or Wednesday, so oh, I was very excited to get that done good for and, you. out of the way. 
So you got out of rehab. Let's continue the story. So you get out of rehab. Uh, you didn't have any slips or anything. It was your first go at it, and you, you stuck to it. What did you find in rehab that really helped you? Um, doing the steps. Doing the steps was um, doing the twelve steps was very was very awesome. Um, we were forced to go to meetings every night, which was just an amazing support. Mm -hmm. And we had a counselor there that uh, we did group every day, and she was so hard on us, but so compassionate at the same time. There's it's, it's life or death. Yeah. basically while well, you're being hard on yourself being out in the street doing what you do exactly and so having somebody else and you live you live in chaos and the thing about the recovery house is you're forced to make your bed you go to aerobics twice a week you know you're forced to eat three meals a day i gained like 40 pounds in the three months that i was there and um <clears throat> you know like it's very structured and and it forces you to be in a in a lifestyle that you should be in opposed mm -hmm. to what what you're used to so I mean, it was just, it's beneficial, the, the meetings, doing 90 meetings in 90 days, having a sponsor, doing the steps, you know, um, don't isolate yourself. And if you have something you need to talk about, talk to your friends. Get into routines, get, get, get proper routines. sleep. Yep. Nutrition plays a big part in it. Huge. Hygiene, like how many times did I f just forget to have a shower for days just because I was high? Yeah. Right? Like. So yeah, it's just getting you all back in that routine of things, and you're constantly seeing people coming in broken and in mm. just desperate, dire need of help. Mm. So you 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 got a, you spent ninety days. At the I was thing? there for four and a half months. Four and a half months. Four and a half okay. months. You need a bit of work, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's no problem with that. But at least you my, you stayed. Mm -hmm. uh, when you got out, was it scary? It was it was so hard coming yeah. back to Chilliwack. Yeah. Because I was safe in Burnaby. Yeah. I was I was in a safe town. I didn't know, you know, it wasn't like oh I used over there or I sold drugs over here or I, you know, did like and then I come back to Chilliwack and it's, it's just it hasn't changed. Yeah. Did you run into old uh, friends? I constantly run into old people that I yeah. used to use with and stuff. And, and how are you with that? Um. Now, now I am much stronger with it because of the schooling that I've been through and the personal decisions that I've made with myself and with God and with you know just. Mm -hmm. Just my own understanding of it now, where I've been, and I don't want to go back to that place. Yeah, are you uh, having people come up and saying you look great? How do can can you help me? Are you are you countering that, or are they just out there? Um, you know, I I've had people like make comments and stuff, and you know, people have called since my last article and stuff. People have called and wanted to you know talk to me about things, but um, I don't know if it's. I know that when I was using out there. You don't want to admit it, right? I see so many people that yeah. still use, how you doing? I ask mm -hmm. them, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, you know? And you just see it in their face. They're yeah. lost and empty, and, and they're not doing great, but yeah. they're ashamed. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a denial, and uh, you really got to really want it. quit. We do. And that, that's, that's a big step, getting out there and saying, I've had enough, I'm ready to surrender, mm -hmm. and i got to do something about it. And... Mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's a hard that's a hard part because you are admitting to everybody in the world it, which seems to you that hey I'm a meth addict or I'm an alcoholic or whatever mm -hmm. and that's a pretty bad place to because you're telling you, yourself you got that. and you got the judgment from other people that you're yeah. afraid of and stuff but yeah. I mean in order to gain control you have to you have to surrender yeah you went to school you went back to school I and went. so I got a whole list of uh, stuff what have you what have you accomplished since you got over rehab um, well, I went back to CDI College and I got my addictions worker diploma. Um, I've completed a 320-hour practicum at Daystar Counseling, which is a Christian facility. And he, um, who I was under, he's got over 20 years of experience in depression, anxiety, you know, sex addictions, and stuff like that. So I was the um, drug addiction feature that kind of went on there. So that was pretty. That was that was great. I had a couple clients there and one-on-one -on -one counseling and documentation and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And I um, volunteer at Mission Community Services on the crisis line. So I went through some training and got my crisis interventionist certificate. Oh, good for you. Thing. So um, that's good and you deal with suicide ideations and um, just yeah. working your front line to me yeah. mental health, right? So and that's one of the things that my addicts, um, whatever substance they have, they're uh, recovering from, just keep him busy. Mm -hmm. Don't have idle time. Get out well, there. Well, exactly. And, do stuff. and I've always said idle hands is the devil's playground, right? And um, I've always just been 
bored, it seems like. I've just always been a bored person, and I have tons of energy that I need to give somewhere, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> might as well try to do some good, right? And yeah. other than that, I've, I've um, you know, I'm involved with my church mm-hmm. a lot, and, I, like, I'm still very fresh, like, out of, so I've, I've been out of the recovery house now for a year. Yeah. But that's not a long time. No, it's not, you no. know, and, and my schooling is a precursor to just so much more. Yeah. Right? Out there and I wanna go back to school and get my social services um degree mm-hmm. and who knows what avenues will open up. Yeah. So are you gonna call Chilliwack your home still? Is this gonna be your place or are you thinking about going to Well me uh, and my boyfriend just moved into a cozy little apartment yesterday, so Oh, so you're planning on it'll, staying it'll, here for it'll while. be a little it'll be our home for at least a couple of years probably. Okay. Don't want to bring the boyfriend in, but did you meet the boyfriend? Uh, I met the boyfriend through meetings. Oh, good. Um, I met him at an NA meeting. Yeah. And basically right after I got out of treatment, and I've been with him ever since. Yeah, that's a powerful partnership. It's a powerful relationship, and he means a lot to me. So. Good. Well, I'm, I'm very glad with that. And uh, uh, you're, uh, you had a story that resonated with filmmaker Beth Miller. Uh, yeah. Tell, talk, let's, uh, <laughs> let's do a plug for <laughs> kind her. kind of forgot about that. Um, yeah, let's I, talk about that. That was um, a pretty amazing experience to be able to go through. Uh, one of the girls in my recovery house um, somehow got in touch with this lady, and she was doing a documentary called Letter to Myself, and um, she got funding through the film board, and she wanted to do this Crystal Meth documentary, and she wanted another voice to be on there, and... When I got out of the recovery house, I got this random phone call, and she's like, hi, this is Beth Miller calling, and I'm doing this documentary, and I'd love for you to be a part of it. And I was quite um, quite impressed, so went out to Vancouver a couple of days and got to go back to my old my old home and do some taping and stuff, and basically it was um, a mock um, life and times of what it was like for us in the recovery house and she's done filming with me at home and a little bit of filming with my mom and stuff of of what what meth is to us you know m- meth is meth is death you know it's just um, this powerful drug that takes over and she wanted to really captivate captivate how down in the depths we were and and hopefully it will get into the school systems hopefully okay. So uh, it'd be compulsory uh, viewing. Yeah. Which uh, you, you're absolutely right, and I hope that that happens. Use it as a prevention and education type thing because it's the producer or the filmmaker is the same one who did um, Through a Blue Lens, and that's a very powerful one also, like, just just mm-hmm. add to the collection of, of documentaries out there. So. Oh, great. Well, that's Beth Miller. What's the name of it? Um, Letter to Myself. Letters to Myself and by yeah. Beth Miller. Mm-hmm. And uh, is there any way that people can get a copy? Um, she you know? plans for it to be done editing by June, and I'm not sure exactly what's happening mm-hmm. with copies and stuff. Probably through the that. National Film Board website, you probably can probably, get Probably, and she is going to try to get it broadcasted. Okay. So that's going to be great. And well, yeah. look, We look forward to seeing that. Well, you know, I, I really got to thank you for coming in. You've got a great story. You've done a really good job with yourself. Thank you. I, looking at you now, I can't even imagine you on uh, crystal meth. But that's what that's what meth does. It, it uh, really uh, puts uh, beautiful people like yourself into dark, deep places. And uh, you can see it. It's out there. Um, you know, if there's any way that people can support, is there any way that the citizens of Chilliwack can support organizations. I just want to say um, yeah. not to you know for people out there just citizens and stuff you know if you see somebody like give them a smile or, or something show some compassion because they are people too and mm-hmm. and the thing that I'm noticing most about what's happening is you know now that the Olympics are coming and everything right they're trying to get rid of the problem and and almost just ship them away or sweep them under the carpet and stuff and that's not how you do it right yeah. and they are people and they're people with problems and and um and there's hope out there, right? You can recover from anything if mm-hmm. you put your mind to it. I was trying to fill that, that empty void inside myself, and I've realized now that that void can only be filled mm-hmm. by God in my, in my eyes, yeah. in my heart, right? Yeah. So, um, so just give him a smile. Yeah, just give him a smile. Buy him a cup of coffee. Do anything to uh, show people care. It's the golden rule. Treat yeah. others how you would like to be treated. Good way to end this. Thank you very much, Carla, Thank for you. coming on.